Hello and welcome back to the second part of the Blender Smoothie tutorial series on creating hydrothermal vents in Blender. And in this part we're going to be taking a look at creating the shader for our smoke simulator and then a little bit of compositing and putting the scene together and everything like that. So let's get started on this right away because I want to cover as much of this as we can without making the tutorial too long. So with this box selected, um, if you remember where we left off, we baked the simulation at the end of the last part, and this is the result. I'm on frame 95, uh, just so we can really get an idea of what the shader is going to look like, since we've got some thinner parts here and some thicker parts up here. We can worry more about a specific frame later. So just pick a frame like that, make sure that the domain is selected, and I split my view into two windows here. As you can see, I just hovered over, hover over, hovered over this these diagonal lines and drag this down to split the window. Change this top window to the node editor and just click new next to the material options there so we can add a new shader. Now I'm going to be using a node setup that's based off of the tutorial uh, that I saw that Blender, Blender Nation I believe shared. A uh, tutorial on setting up a good smoke shader in Blender using cycles. Uh, so I'll post a link to that in the description of this video because that one was a lot more in-depth and covered fire as well as smoke and all these other things. Um, so again, I'll post a link down there so you can see that. And something to keep in mind, something to consider actually before I go too much farther is you have to be using a very recent build of Blender for this to work properly. I'm using version 2.70.2. Uh, the reason for this, of course, is because I don't believe volumetric materials for the smoke simulator have been fully implemented into Blender yet, or at least into a final release of Blender, an official release of Blender. So I'll have a link uh, in the description of this video for some builds with that as well. Uh, but let's move on with this. So first of all, I'm going to delete this diffuse shader because we're going to be working strictly with volume shaders here. And I'm going to go ahead and add a volume shader. First I'm going to add a volume scatter shader. And then I'm also going to add oops, shader, a volume absorption shader. And basically we're going to combine these by adding another shader, an add shader. And we'll plug this one into the first input, that one into the second input, and we'll plug this node into the volume input on the material output. So basically this is combining the volume scattering and the volume absorption, which basically determines in this case, you know, how light is scattered through the volume. And, uh, basically you have a lot more control over the density and the color and everything like that, especially the color. The color is the main reason you want to use both of these, um, is because you can have some more realistic looking colors if you have different values for each uh, color inputs in these. So if I were to go into, let me make sure this is, okay. If I were to go into rendered view right now, uh, of course we would see this. It's a volumetric cube, so obviously the volume shaders worked, but we need to have some sort of data inserted into this to actually load the smoke information so that it's not just uh, applying this shader to the domain cube. So to do that, we're going to use an attribute node. So I'm just going to press Shift A, hover over input, and we'll find this attribute node right here. And Basically, what we're going to do is we're going to use an attribute, uh, sort of like we did towards the beginning of the tutorial series on, in the first part when we used multiple UV maps. Do you remember that we called, uh, we basically used different UV maps on the same object and we used the attribute node for that. So we're going to do that again, but this time with the smoke simulator. And in this case, the attribute we're looking for is density. So go ahead and type density into the name. And this is, of course, a preset value or a preset piece of information in Blender that we can use, that we can access through this attribute node. And so we're going to use this data uh, so that the smoke or the volumetric shaders are applied only to the smoke and not to the entire domain cube. We want to have a little more control over this though, so I'm also going to press Shift A and I'm going to add a brightness and contrast node. And I'm going to leave rendered view there because it's kind of lagging a bit. So that'll speed it up a bit more. And we want to plug this factor into the color of that. Uh, and basically what this is going to do is, in some cases you can adjust the smoke scale. Um, I believe if you adjust the contrast node, I might have might go into the brightness instead of the color. Um, but yeah, I think it goes into the color. 
And basically, if you adjust the contrast, then then sometimes you'll get uh, different scales of smokes, basically, of smoke. So you might adjust the contrast to increase it to make it look like the smoke was a lot larger than it actually is in the simulation. In this case, we're not really going to be messing with that because the default settings, it's all, it's all pretty good for the scale that we're looking for. So we won't have to worry about that. So in this case, this is sort of just an intermediary so that we can adjust the density of the smoke. And to do that, basically, I'm just going to press Shift A again. And we're going to add a math node. We'll change this from add to multiply. And I'm going to plug this into the first value. And then basically, this second value, whatever we adjust this to, that will adjust the density of our smoke. And I'm going to plug this value into the density in there and the density in there. So if we go ahead and switch this to rendered now, you'll see that it's actually using the smoke data, which is what we wanted. So it's not just applying it to the whole domain cube like it was before. And that's, of course, because we got the attribute node, or we loaded the density attribute into the attribute node and tweaked it a little bit. We haven't actually done much with it, but we basically applied it to the density of these volume nodes since we plugged it into these density inputs. Um, now, something else that we can do to help streamline this a little more is if we sort of put these all into a group. And again, that was what uh, was covered in the initial tutorial that was a lot more in-depth than this. Uh, so we're just going to make a really quick node group, just because if we want to go ahead and use this shader in another .blend file or something, that's a lot easier if it's in a node group. So I'm basically just going to press B, drag a box around all those nodes, and press Control g and that just put them in a group and I can go ahead and press tab to exit out of that so that we just have this little node and we can go ahead and name that, we'll just name it smoke and we do want to add a couple inputs to this so we can tweak it from this little node preview thing instead of having to press tab every single time to go into this so you'll see over here we have this option to add some inputs to this so I'm just going to go ahead and add a single input and we'll name this first input, uh, let's say, scatter. And we'll go ahead and plug the volume color, or the color input on the volume scatter node to this. So basically, if I press tab to go back into this now, oop, I think I have to select a, let's see here. Alright, uh, so it looks like I did that in the wrong order. Uh, basically, before you go ahead and uh, create a new input, you want to actually create the input by dropping this color value into the input in the first place. So basically, let me just delete this. Instead of adding a new input over here first, you want to drop this color input into this little hollow circle shape over here on the group input node and that will create a new input specific to that uh, attribute, which in this case is a color box. So let's go ahead and rename this by control clicking it, and we'll just call it scatter. And then we can do the same thing with this volume absorption node. And go ahead and take that color input and drop it into that second option there to create a new input. Control click, and we'll name this absorption. All right. And then there's really only one other thing I want to do, and that's to just go ahead and take this other value on the multiply node, drop that into there, and then we'll just name this density, because again, that adjusts the density of our smoke. And we could create a separate scale input too, but in this case I'm not going to do that, because like I said, we're not going to be tweaking the scale. So now we have this, which is a lot easier to work with than what we had before. So if I go into rendered view again, take a look at this, the first thing we want to do is we want to make this darker because this is a black smoker and the smoke's kind of kind of gray, a little too light. So we want to make this a lot darker, maybe something more like uh, about halfway between black and white. So sort of a middle range gray color there, something like that. And a lot of this is done in the lighting. Uh, so we shouldn't worry too much about the color right now until we've actually set up the scene. Uh, but the other thing we want to do is we want to adjust this density value because it's way too small right now. I'm going to try something like 10. 
And as you can see, that smoke is a lot more dense than what we had before. And it looks a lot more realistic, too. Uh, especially considering, if you're considering it as something coming from a black smoker. Let me just kind of kind of check and see what some of these other frames look like. Whoa. That's kind of cool. All right, we'll stay at 95 for now. Okay, so that's essentially all we're going to be doing with the smoke shader. Uh, we can go back and tweak the colors later, maybe tweak the density later. For now, the thing that we want to worry about is setting up this scene. Uh, so basically, in the scene that I had set up, first of all, I'll position my camera in front view, approximately. So to do that, just press 1 on your number pad to go into front view. Sort of position this so that it, the black sea vent or the uh, deep sea vent is kind of in the center, something like that and press Control alt 0 and it should lock your camera to that view. And then we can sort of move this around. I'm just uh, pressing G and clicking the middle mouse button once to move it back and forth like this. And I just sort of found a position. Maybe we can move that up a bit. We don't want the top of the domain cube to be visible, obviously. So that's something to keep in mind because then we'll see the area where the smoke is flattening up against there and it doesn't look realistic at all. So we'll try something like that and then maybe I'll sort of rotate it along the z-axis a little bit to kind of push that over to the side again. And of course I also created another second vent which we're not going to do in this case uh, just because we just repeat the same process that we did for this one and that would be pretty time consuming. So we'll just leave it at one for now. And the other thing that I did is I also positioned the light uh, pretty much right behind the camera, slightly above the camera, to make it look like it was taken from a camera that also contained the light source. Um, or that the light source was at least very close to the camera, which makes it look a lot more like an undersea photo. So I'm actually just going to go into top view here, kind of move this over. I'm going to press Alt-R to clear the rotation. I'll just try RX90 so that I just rotated it 90 degrees along the x-axis so it's totally vertical. And then I'll maybe angle it a little bit, something like that. Maybe put it a little bit above the camera, and scale it down a little too to make the shadows sharper. That's something to keep in mind is the smaller the light object, then the sharper the shadows will be. We don't want them to be super sharp, but we do want them to be, we don't want them to be too soft either. Some size about that will probably work. And I'll just just sort of rotating it a little bit more, pressing R, just to see if we can get sort of a better angle on that. And we'll try that to start with. Let's just see how that looks. We're probably going to have to increase that strength pretty significantly. Uh, so let's go ahead and go into rendered view and see how this looks. Yeah, it's pretty dark. Let's try 4,000. That's better. Try 6,000. It's getting there. Um. We'll keep it at that for now, and then we'll add a couple elements of scenery here just to see if we can visualize this a little better. So the other thing I did is I just added a plane, ground plane, and sort of scaled that out quite a bit. Um, sort of move that over a little more. I also increased the camera's limits uh, because if you'll notice, if I scale this out too far, then part of it disappears sort of off on the horizon. So I'm going to right-click the camera to change this and go to the camera options in the properties panel on the right. And uh, you'll see an option here that says clipping with a start and end option. We just want to change that end value to something like, I don't know, 250. So that now when we scale this up, we'd have to scale it up a lot more before it starts to disappear. Now, we don't want it to be too big. And we can also sort of slide it forward like that pressing G, Y to lock it to the Y axis uh, because of course all that other stuff behind the camera won't be visible so we might as well use that to our advantage. Um, I think in this case for the rest of this I'm probably just going to add a displacement modifier uh, to sort of get this to look more like an actual piece of landscape. Something else you could do is you could use the landscape generator add-on which you find by pressing Control alt u going to add-ons and yeah, it's right there that add-on ANT landscape and that can produce some cool results too uh, but it's generally a lot faster just to use a displacement modifier 
especially since this is just sort of in the background. So I'm going to go ahead and press tab, go into edit mode, and I'm going to subdivide this, we'll say 10 times. The reason I'm doing this before I add the multi-res modifier and everything is because uh, if we just leave it at a single face, then it'll turn it into a circle because there aren't enough edge loops in it to keep it square shape. So we want to do that so that that doesn't happen. Press tab to go back into object mode. I'm actually just going to add a subsurf modifier. It's the easiest way to go about it. And we'll start out with two levels just to kind of see how that looks. We're probably going to have to make it more than that. But... And I'll add a displacement modifier. And next to texture down here, I'll click new just to add a new texture. And we'll lower the strength to something like 0.1. Maybe we could even make it negative, we'll make it negative 0.1. Because uh, that gives you some of the sharper noise elements on top. And I'm going to, we'll increase that to maybe 4. I'm not too happy with the level of detail on that, so I'm going to come over here to the texture options here, and you'll see it's already loaded our texture for the displacement modifier. If it hasn't, just click on this menu up here, and you should be able to find it right there under modifiers. And we can increase this depth to something higher, we'll say 5 for now. And I'm going to lower the strength even more to like negative 0 0.05, just to flatten it out. Maybe even negative 0 0.03, because we don't want this to be too hilly or anything. We'll go ahead and set that to smooth. And for this, basically, I just pulled a texture off of CG textures, and that was like a basic sand texture, and I used that. Um, maybe I can go ahead and go to the UV image editor and let's see if we can open one. Um, try. You know, actually, might have. If I come in here. Have a couple textures that I actually created for this that I think I'll use instead. Just because it's, it's a lot easier to work with this way. So I'm just going to go ahead and, I don't know open this one. That'll probably work. And go ahead and uh, press tab over here to go into edit mode. U to unwrap. Project from view. And this is, of course, a tileable texture, so I'll just scale that up. Um, let's go ahead and split the view here. Go to the node editor. Add a new shader. And press shift A. Texture. Image texture. Plug the color into the color there. And let's load that image texture just so that when we go into textured view we can actually see what we're working with here. Alright, if I go into camera view here, it's pretty good. I could scale it up even more than that probably. Alright, something like that. And then maybe we'll also add a little bit of bump mapping. Just add a converter math node, plug that into the displacement, change the add to multiply, drop this into the first input, Probably 0.25 will be a good value because we don't want it too high. All right, and let's see how this looks. I'm going to save it before we go any farther because I don't want it to crash. And okay, so that's that's pretty good. Uh, we can see that the shadows are almost not visible essentially because of where the light is positioned, which is actually what we're going for in this case. So that works pretty well. Uh, you may be wondering about the blue coloring and everything, and of course that's something we're going to be doing in post-processing, so we don't have to worry about the colors of lights or anything like that right now. We'll do that in color grading later on. Alright, so that works pretty well. Um, I think I'm actually going to leave it at that right now, just because, uh, well, for efficiency's sake. Like I said before, in my final scene I added another C vent there, and then I also basically created another layer of rock to put under the sand that I kind of put in the exact same location as the sand and then used the displacement modifier on that one too so that there were some areas of rock that kind of cropped up and then sand in other spots and that, that helped sell the realism a little more and added a little bit more detail. Uh, but for time's sake we're not going to go over that right now. So. There's one other thing to consider before we move on. Actually, two other things. Uh, one is we're going to add particles, because that really helps sell the effect again, is having little uh, particles that get caught in the light. Um, and the other thing is the issue of distance and how the background fades away. So we can't use a map value node or mist feature or anything like that for this because we have a smoke simulation. 
And because of that, then we'll run into some problems with uh, the domain queue basically cutting out parts of the image, and it looks really weird, and it doesn't work at all. So we have two options then to sort of help the background fade away. What I did in my final render is I added another smoke simulation in the back, which also helps sell the realism and that there was a little bit more ambient smoke kind of floating out. And that looked a little more realistic too. And then another option is to use world volumetrics, which takes a really, really, really long time to render. Um, in this case, I'm not going to do either just for the sake of time, but let me show you really quickly just how the world volumetrics thing works. Um, so I'm going to split my window again, and we'll go to the node editor here. And instead of adding a new material or working with the material of this sand, I'm going to click on this world icon. And I'll, ch click, I'll click the use nodes option. And basically what we want to do here is we want to have, we press shift A and we can add shader. And we want to add, I can't remember if it was a volume absorption or a volume scatter node. Actually, I think it was a volume scatter node is what we want to be using. And you want to plug that into the volume option. And basically now we can sort of tweak this, tweak the density value uh, to set the volume or the thickness of this volumetric rendering to different levels. Um, and it does help sell the effect, the mist effect especially, so that things in the background sort of fade away slowly. But again, it's really, really intense uh, on your processor or your video card. It takes a really long time to render. Uh, so I'm not actually going to do that in this case, just for the sake of time. But those are the two options to consider, is having this sort of volumetric setup for the world, or creating another smoke simulation that covers the back. Uh, either of those would probably work pretty well. But in this case, we're going to move on to adding the particles and then a little bit of compositing. And I'm also going to increase the strength of this, because that didn't look very bright before. We'll try 7,500. All right, so for the particles, all I did is I added a plane, and I pressed S to sort of scale it up. Oops, S to scale it up. And, of course, you don't have to do this over the entire uh, scene, because that just wouldn't work out very well. It'd be super inefficient. Uh, so I made it maybe something like this size. Maybe even a little bit bigger than that, something like that. And I basically, oops, want to move that up out of the view of the camera doesn't really matter because we're going to be hiding it anyway, but just to be on the safe side. I went over and I added a particle system, so we'll add a new particle system. We'll just name this, I don't know, particles. It's kind of pointless to rename it, I guess, but whatever. And basically I used icospheres as objects. So I'm just going to go to a second layer here and add an icosphere. And over here on the left on the toolbar, there should be an option to adjust the subdivisions. We want to lower that to one just so that there aren't quite as many polygons and everything, so it doesn't take as long to render. And now if I go back over here to this plane with our particle system, and go to object in this case, and load the icosphere object. Oops, I want to be careful because we started out in frame 95. Then you can see they're falling. They look pretty nice, except there is one problem. First of all, we don't need the end frame to be 200. We can make the end frame 100, because right now we're working with frame 95, so there's really no need to have them go that long. And we can also increase the lifespan to something like 500, which is pretty high. We'll, make, we'll say 250. There's no need to go above the actual number of frames in the scene. All right, and you'll notice that we've got this weird sort of buggy thing going on. Uh, typically to fix that, I just adjust the number of particles. So let's make it 1,005 or something. And that typically takes care of that issue. So now they're falling pretty nicely. And that looks pretty good. Okay, I want to adjust the scale a little bit too, though. I'm going to make that more like 0 0.035. And let's go to frame 95 again so we can sort of work with this a little better. Okay, so let's go ahead and rent, go into the rendered preview now. Oh, <laughs> oops, kind of forgot that I still had that uh, volumetric thing going on with the world. So I'm going to split my view to the node editor, go to the world option, and I'm just going to delete that volume scatter node. Okay, we'll try that again. <laughs> All right, that's much better. 
Um, so yeah, we can see the little particles there. They're kind of catching the light. It'll really show up a lot more when we uh, work with the post-processing a little bit. That's pretty helpful. I do want to uh, select this plane again, though, and come over here and uncheck Emitter on the render options because we don't want that plane actually being there. It could cast shadows or bounce extra light on certain objects, and we don't want that. All right, so at this point, we're pretty much done with the scene setup, and now all we have left to do is compositing. So let's get going on that. I'm just going to render something out really quickly that we can use. Before we go any farther, though, I guess we do want to adjust the world color. So we're just going to make it a really, really dark blue. So that now if I go back into rendered view, there we go. That's better. That is something pretty important to do. Uh, so make sure you take care of that first. Keep forgetting that we can't use the map value node or anything like that. And I'm just going to go ahead and render this. I'm going to try a slightly smaller size just because we don't need it that big. Sampling. We can start out with 10 samples. We'll just see how that goes. So I'm going to render this and we'll see if that's enough samples. It should be fine. All right, one thing I'm noticing that I want to change really quickly before we move on is that some of those particles are pretty big. So I'm going to really quickly decrease that size a little more, like 0 0.025. Okay, and now I'll render it. It doesn't really matter after a certain threshold how large these particles are because they're going to get blurred out anyway. Um, but you don't want them too big. Alright, so that's pretty good. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and go to the compositing setup here, and I'm actually going to combine these two windows there and merge these two as well. We'll just select Use Nodes and enable the backdrop. I'm going to scroll out quite a bit actually because we're going to be adding a couple nodes here. And I'm going to add a viewer node on the output there. Okay, so the first thing we want to do is the color grading before we do anything else, because right now it's not nearly desaturated or blue enough uh, to be believable as a, an, a photo taken underwater. So I'm gonna I'm gonna hover over color here, and I'm gonna add not a color correction node, it's a color balance node is the first thing that we want to be working with, and we'll connect those inputs there and plug in the image input to there. I'm going to sort of scroll in on this so we can kind of see how this works. So we want to set the gain to blue. These are essentially the highlights. The midtones to slightly blue, something like that. And then the shadows to blue, even slighter. Because when you, if you really set the shadows to blue, then you start getting really weird results like that. So you want to make it a very subtle effect on the shadows. You're really working more with the gain in the gamma. Um, so we can sort of move that around. Kind of mess with this a little bit. Maybe add a little more green in there. Really make that blue. That's a little better. Move that over a little bit more. Okay, something like that. We can always tweak that later. It's pretty good for now. And I'm just going to move this out of our way then. And the next thing we want to do is we want to adjust the brightness and contrast because it's kind of dim in the front, maybe a little too dark towards the back of this, and we want to tweak that some. So let's go ahead and add a, let's use an RGB curves node. And the reason I'm using this instead of the brightness and contrast node is just because it's easier to have a little more control over everything. And you also don't have to sort of adjust the brightness and contrast together in order to keep it looking good. Um, it's a lot easier to just work with points on a curve like this. So I do want to make the whole image, the overall image, a little brighter, not that much brighter. <laughs> Something like that would probably work pretty well. There's still a little too much green in there for my taste, so I'm going to sort of move that over more to the blue. That's a little better. Okay. Uh, so that's a little brighter. That looks a lot better than it did before. Uh, but the effect that you really need to work on the most is the glow. And this is really important. We're going to add a couple different kinds of glow, I think. So first I'm going to add a blur node. And I'm going to plug that into there. We'll set this to fast Gaussian. Maybe 10. Probably be good enough. Maybe a little more than that. We'll try 15. And I'm just going to add a color mix node. And we will mix these together. 
And I am actually going to be using a mix node for this. And the reason for that is if we switch it to add or something, sometimes it just gets a little too bright. I like to be able to control the brightness of the image often with the RGB curves instead of a mix node like this. So I generally just let a little bit of that show up. Something like that will probably work pretty well. And so that's actually we'll make that we'll make that 10 instead of 15 because we want to make this sort of our smaller glow and then we're going to add a larger glow as well. So I'm going to add that blur node again and we'll kind of blur this. Um, and we'll make that more like 50. Something pretty significant like that. And then we'll go ahead and mix these together. All right, so now we've got our larger glow, and that looks pretty good. Maybe point something like that. That's that's too much. We'll try point one five because we don't want it to be too intense. Um, so that really helps sell the underwater effect. Uh, so that's something to keep in mind when you're working with the glows. And at this point. We can see that the particles are blurred out pretty nicely. Something else that uh, we might want to do, actually, that I'm going to take care of right now, that also really helps sell the effect that I totally forgot to do to begin with, is adding depth of field. So we really want to take care of that. Um, and I'm just going to set the focus. So I just selected the camera, came over here to the camera properties. And you'll see down here there's an option for focus. So you can select a specific object to focus on. And I'm going to select our C-Vent object that we named vent. So I'm just going to load that there. And we'll adjust the size. We'll make it something like 0.9. It's probably too much. 0.1. I can never remember what order to adjust that in to make it bigger or smaller. Let's see how that looks. All right. Looks like it's sort of affecting the back a little bit. Let me try 0.25. Maybe that'll help. Make that a little more noticeable. We don't want it to be too obvious, because uh, then it starts looking like a miniature. That's sort of what we're getting now. That's, that's too significant. I think point 0.1 will work pretty nicely. So let's go ahead and re-render that really quickly. I meant to include that earlier on. But that is something that really helps, especially with the particles, because it sort of blurs them out so they're kind of closer together in size, and it makes it look a lot more realistic. OK. So we can go back into compositing now and work with this a little bit more. Um, really, from this point on, other than a little bit more tweaking and the color correction and the brightness and contrast and glows, we just want to add a little bit of a vignette and some chromatic aberration. So let's start with the vignette. Let's just go ahead and add a lens distortion node here, bring the distortion all the way up to 1. Converter, math, greater than. Set that value to 0 to isolate that white circle in the center. And let's add a blur node to that. Oops, set it to fast Gaussian. Maybe around 125 will work. Yeah, that looks pretty good. And we'll go ahead and mix that. Change that from mix to multiply. And that should work pretty well. Oops. Put them in the wrong order. Alright. And you want that to be fairly strong, actually, in the case of an underwater image, because it helps sort of make it look like the light is a little more directional uh, by sort of shadowing off the edges a little bit. So maybe even 0.85 would work, something like that. And we'll try 0.8. Okay. And then finally, we want to work with the chromatic aberration. I'm going to scroll out a little bit to make some more room for this. And in this case, instead of using the method that is typically used, which is just uh, adding a lens distortion node and uh, tweaking the dispersion value, um, I'm actually going to use a different method that I first saw in a tutorial on Blender Cookie by, I think it was Kent Trammell, but I'll have to go back and double check that, um, in the Jellyfish tutorial, where he used chromatic aberration by separating the color channels and displacing them. And the reason I think that's a better method is because it doesn't look as blurry when you do it. When you tweak the dispersion value on the lens distortion node, it results in a really blurry image, even if you only use it slightly, and it just doesn't work out very well. Um, so to make a sharper image, that's typically the method I prefer. 
So I'm just going to go ahead and add, I believe it was under, not mat, it was under converter. And we're going to separate RGBA. And then I'm going to add a combine RGBA node, plug the red into the red, the green into the green, the blue into the blue, and even the alpha into the alpha, even though we're not really working with the alpha. So basically, uh, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to press Shift A and add a distort node, and I'm just going to add a translate node. And we'll just plug that into the red channel. So basically, what I'm doing with this is I'm splitting up the channels, the color channels, so the, the red channel is on its own, and so is the green and the blue. Uh, and then I'm recombining them so that they're back to the way they were before. So essentially there's no difference in that case. But I'm adding a translate node to the middle of this red connection there, so between the separation of the red and the addition of the red, so that basically I'm shifting the red channel a little bit, so that all the red values in this image are shifted slightly and that provides that sort of color fringe effect that we call chromatic aberration. So I'm going to adjust these x and y values. We'll try 0.1 to start with, and 0.1. Maybe a little more than that. We'll try 0 0.25, 0 0.25, and maybe even a little stronger. You want to be careful. You don't want to make it too strong, but you do want it to be slightly noticeable. And I think that's a pretty good value right there. I uh, probably can't see it at all in the video, but that helps add that extra subtle touch of realism. And that's pretty much it. So, yeah, if you want to tweak this a little bit more, you might do what I did and add another deep sea vent, maybe even more than two, maybe add a couple other ones, a couple other rocky formations. Uh, you might try out the volumetric world options there to see what that's like, to add some actual volumetrics in the background of your world. Um, or you might try the smoke simulator method. And that's, that's pretty much it. You just keep tweaking the colors and the brightness and contrast until you're happy with the result. And that's all. So thank you for watching this tutorial series. I hope you learned something from it, and from the second part specifically. And I hope to see you on the next one.